Hi everyone, let's uh, give this a try. I've got some new recording settings on this, so I'm really hoping this will work. Uh, and I have the test coming up in half an hour, so I'm going to make sure that we get done in half an hour for this. I might go a little fast, but this is mo mostly supposed to be a review that you can take in before Friday's lecture, or if you have to, after Friday's lecture, to help you remember what was gone over in organic chemistry and set the stage for us to talk about sugars on Friday. So, let's see how this works. The whole point of this lecture is that sugars were introduced in organic chemistry, and it's one of the things that you can carry over from there. And actually, we need to use that as the foundation for where we're going to talk about sugars. We're going to review what you need to remember that, and I'm going to have a special appearance from, used to be Baby Ben, but now he insists that we don't call him the baby anymore, he's Benjamin, okay? So you can look forward to that coming up. The three things that you should bring over from the or original organic uh, that you had. Uh, there's three things about sugars that are really organic chemistry elements. Number one, sugars have either aldehyde or ketone groups at one end. This is the reactive end, and so we'll call them an aldose if they have an aldehyde, a ketose if they have the uh, a ketone at that end. That end is the important end, and it's where we're going to start all our numbering, and we're going to move to the other unreactive end as we move down. So just a little bit of nomenclature. At the bottom end, you're going to have a bunch of chiral carbons, and then you usually have a non-chiral carbon. The last chiral carbon is important because it will show you whether the sugar that you have is an L sugar or a D sugar. It turns out that um, most of the sugars that we have are a certain direction when it comes to L versus D, just like amino acids. So we'll show you this, and just remember what the natural direction is. Technically, the D isomer of glucose will have the opposite chirality at every chiral atom, not just this last atom. So that means that you rarely encounter the true D isomer of glucose. But you can tell whether it's a natural isomer, whether it's, the, um, whether it's got the OH to the right or to the left. I'll show you that in just a second. Now, the number of carbons and the stereochemistry of the middle chir chiral carbons, they determine the name of the sugar. And so let's take a look at a few examples. Of course, the most important sugar is probably glucose. You see it's got an aldehyde at one end, and so we're going to number it from that end. We're going to call it an aldose. Fructose is very similar to glucose, but it has a ketone at one end. So that's going to be a ketose, because ketones are going to react differently than aldehydes. You can probably tell that the aldehyde will be more reactive, so glucose will be a little more reactive than fructose, but they do very similar reactions. Now, the last chiral carbon, if we go down to rule number two, we see that we have hydroxyls to the right, and to the right means D. To the left means L. And so we can see that both of these are D sugars. These are the natural D sugars. So most sugars, natural sugars, are going to be D sugars, especially the prominently used glucose, fructose, ribose, and all those. It's the kind of handedness that you see in amino acids. It's just, this is how it shows up in sugars. So if we number the carbons from reactive end to non-reactive end, we end up with one, two, three, four, five, six. Both of these are hexoses, and we can use that to talk about them. Here are pentoses. This is ribose, and you see that they are both aldoses. They both are D sugars, because they had the last chiral carbon to the right. And then if you count down from the reactive end, they both are pentoses. In fact, the only difference that you can see is that the one on the right, the one over here, if you can see that, is missing an OH group. And so that means that uh, that's the only difference between those, but these are both important because the one on the left, this is ribose, and the one on the right, well, what are we going to call it? 2-deoxyribose. So we follow organic chemistry conventions and we number the carbons according to the system that we have here. Now, the one thing about this is that you see that it has all those tetrahedral carbons. It's shown as 90 degree angles because we've drawn them in the plane of the paper. That's what's called a Fischer projection. And so if you look at this, this is a Fischer projection of ribose and deoxyribose. Fischer projections follow a simple rule. Up and down means that it's going away from you. Right and left means that it's coming towards you. And so um, the thing about these is these are important for establishing the exact chirality. And in a Fischer projection, if you have the mirror image in a Fischer projection, 
it will also be the mirror image in a 3D representation. And so you can see that that's why we have the rule that if you have the OH to the right at that last carbon, that you have a D carbon. If it's to the left at that last carbon, you have an L carbon, uh, L chirality, L sugar. And so um, that's because this whole mirror image thing works out really well. If you imagine that this is, uh, you can see that this is an exact representation of the Fisher projection of, the, um, of this simple sugar, glyceraldehyde. It's a triose, a three carbon sugar, and you can see it's an aldose. And you can have the D and the L versions. They really look like this at the bottom for the perspective formulas, but the Fisher projections at the top are easier to draw. And so that's the way I want you to understand it, and it's also the easiest way to draw it on your test and on the homework. The way to remember how Fisher projections work is with an example of baby Ben. This is when he was a baby. He's much bigger now, he'll tell you. But um, he actually has four points coming out of his center, like his torso is the carbon at the center, the chiral carbon, and he has his head, his feet, so, and his two hands are the four parts of that chiral carbon, the four groups attached to it. So if we say that his head is an aldehyde and his feet are a CH2OH group, and then his uh, right hand is an H and his left hand is an OH, then he's exactly like a model of glyceraldehyde. In fact, he's even got the angles kind of right if he's doing this right here because he's got his head back. And you see how he's got his head back and his arms are towards you. Um, if you think of it that way, the head and the, the feet are sort of going back away from you. The arms are coming towards you. And that's exactly like a Fisher projection is. So a Fisher projection is like baby Ben wanting to be picked up. I tried to make it so you can see that Fisher projection, like you have this one chiral carbon for D-glyceraldehyde. And you can imagine rotating it so that different things are pointing at you, but the two other things are going to be pointing away. And the important thing is that the D arrangement of these things will not be changed without breaking a covalent bond. So it's a chiral isomer of glyceraldehyde. It's always going to be like this. You can rotate it any one of these three ways, just like I could pick up baby Ben and I could rotate him uh, different ways, but his left hand would always stay on the left and his right hand would stay on the right. I've sort of done an example of how you could rotate baby Ben with this diagram, but then I looked at that and I'm like, that doesn't work for me, you know. Um, I want to actually do it, but you can look at, you can see the aldehyde group and the feet group are here. The H group and the OH group are there. So if I rotate that so that the head is going away from me, but the feet are coming toward me, then the left hand will be coming toward me and the right hand will be pointing away. Or if I rotate so that the feet are coming toward me on the right, then I will have the left hand in the back and the right hand coming towards me. This is all just like rotating. If baby Ben is a glyceraldehyde, I can rotate him, but I can't switch his left and right hand. You know, his left and right hands are going to stay the same. So I did an example of what it looks like now with actually picking him up, and I'm not sure it worked too well, but we can see we tried. So we have the aldehyde at the head, and we have the, um, the OH group at the feet. Left hand is H, right hand is OH. So I can pick him up and rotate him, and he has a hard time keeping the angles right as I'm rotating him. You know, imagine that. It's kind of hard to do. But you can sort of imagine if the head is coming at you, uh, or if the head is going away from you and the, the, um, the green hand is going away from you, then the yellow hand and the blue feet are coming towards you. And likewise, the, uh, if the head is going away from you, the blue feet are coming towards you on the right, then you have the left hand going away from you and the right hand coming towards you. This actually is accurate. The angles aren't accurate, but the toward you away from you is kind of accurate. But um, Ben got tired and then didn't want to do any more, so this is the best I could do for it. It's all about imagining where those hands are going, and the hands are not switching. You, if you have two things coming towards you, you're going to have the two other things going away from you, and it's always in the same arrangement for D-glyceraldehyde. Another term that's important to remember is epimers. Epimers mean that sugars are different only at one chiral center. So if you look here, um, we have three epimers, or actually technically two pairs of epimers. Mannose and glucose are epimers because their C2s have different chirality. You see the OH is to the right for glucose, it's to the left for mannose. 
galactose and glucose are epimers at C4 because you have it to the right for glucose and you have it to the left for galactose. The important thing is galactose and mannose are not epimers because they differ at two carbons. Epimers only have one difference between them, and so um, mannose and galactose are the only two pairs, uh, are the only pair that is not an epimer shown here. So, I want to tell you which sugars to memorize. You're going to have to memorize some stuff. Actually, that's kind of welcome at this point. It's nice to be able to just memorize stuff and know you'll get points on the test for it. And, and you don't need to memorize all the sugars, so let me tell you which ones you need to memorize. You need to memorize two trioses, glyceraldehyde and dihydroxyacetone. Now these are drawn according to the Fisher projections, so the red carbons are going to be chiral where it really matters left, right coming towards you, up, down, going away from you. So you need to memorize those. Those are at least very simple. You have an, a triose that's an aldose and a, a triose that is a um, ketose. There's five of the pentaldoses that are important, ribose, arabinose, and xylose. There's one of the pentaketoses that's important, ribulose. Xylose is not important. So I will block that out. And on the last one, the one that I didn't show you, the one on the far right, not important. So um, we have three hexaldoses that are important, glucose, mannose, and galactose, the three that we've already shown. These are the ones that you'll run across frequently, and you see that they also have the boxes down here. And there is one hexaketose that's important, that is fructose. That's 10 carbons that you need to remember, and remember them by the Fischer projection. For example, remember that fructose is a hexose, it is a ketose, and then remember the chirality of the three red carbons. And the way I remember that is fructose is left, right, right. And that will allow me to uh, redraw these on the homework and on the exam. Okay. So for these 10 important sugars, you need to know the length of chain, know their name, they have a three-letter abbreviation uh, so that will be distinct from the three-letter abbreviations for amino acids, because we don't want to confuse those, whether they're an aldose or a ketose, and be able to basically draw them. You don't need to draw the ones that I have not highlighted. You need to just draw those 10. So you'll need to know what their structure is, and if you know what the Fisher protection is, you can also tell how they react in other ways. Um, so sugars, and actually the sugars are, sugar isomers can be converted, you know, uh, if you have like an epimer or a sugar that's closely related to another sugar, you can completely convert it with a simple step sometimes. For example, this is an organic chemistry reaction that takes D-glucose in its cyclic form, I'll talk about that in just a second, and it does a little, it just moves a couple atoms around, it's one titanium atom that acts as a catalyst to sort of move some electrons around, move some hydrogens around, and you end up with a completely different sugar. Titanium will enzymatically convert glucose to L-sorbose, and that seems like a pretty big deal because you're completely changing the name, but really what you're doing is you're just moving one bond around. So sugars are closely related. Just because the name's different doesn't mean that the structure is very different. Now the one thing about these sugars is they have aldehydes or ketones on them. And there's one important reaction that aldehydes and ketones can do, slightly different versions of the same reaction. They can react with alcohols. When they react with alcohols, they form covalent bonds, and so that's really important. An aldehyde can react with an alcohol to form a hemiacetal. A hemiacetal can react with another alcohol to form a full acetal, to form a second covalent bond. Now this is really crucial because covalent bonds are how things hold together in biochemistry, and so this is an important thing to how sugars react. Aldehydes react with alcohols to form hemiacetals with one alcohol attached or acetals with two alcohols attached. Ketones do the same thing. It's just that ketones, you know, notice with the aldehyde that you have the extra H, it sticks around until the very end. And so the ketone just has an R group instead of the H. It does the exact same chemistry. It can bind one alcohol to make a hemiketal and it can bind two alcohols to make a full ketal. So this is, this is cool because it makes covalent bonds, and also one thing that's um, even cooler about it, the full acetal, when you're bound to two alcohols, two O groups, the acetal and the ketal are more stable than the hemiacetal and the hemiketal, respectively. So you form a less stable hemiacetal, 
but if you react it again with another alcohol, you make a more stable acetal. This ends up being very important. But if you look at the sugar, the sugar itself has within it alcohol groups that can react with itself. It can eat its own tail, like that snake eating its own tail. And if you look at glucose, for example, you know, um, if you look at the other end of the molecule, there's enough flexibility in all these carbons for this C5 or the C6 to reach around with the OH and for that alcohol to react with the C1. So for example, it's, it's actually a very stable structure to form a hexagon where the OH of the C5 attacks like this, nucleophilic attack, for the uh, aldehyde, and that makes a hemiacetal. So that means that glucose can do this. The C5 can react with the C1. And it can form, and if you think about it, when it attacks, it depends on which way this aldehyde is rotated. It can attack from the bottom, or it can attack from the top. If it attacks from the bottom, it will make one isomer, and it forms a covalent bond. So it forms a relatively stable arrangement that you can trap and you can purify out and crystallize and stuff like that. And so when you have glucose that's able to react with itself, it can form two isomers, either the isomer with the OH group going uh, down and the H going up, or the isomer with the OH group going up and the H going down. The one on the left is called the, we call the alpha isomer. The one on the right is called the beta isomer. I remember these because you look at the little periscope. Look at the C6 right here. It's a little periscope sticking up. And you've got the beta, the, the OH is also sticking up. So I remember that as if they are both on the same side, if you had the C1OH and the C5 periscope, the C65C6 periscope, if they are both on the same side of the cyclic molecule, then you have a beta. Both means beta. If they are on opposite sides, like on the left over here, they are opposite, and that's a vowel kind of like A, so that would be, imply alpha. It's a little bit of a stretch, but it's how I remember it. Both on the same side, beta, um, on opposite sides, alpha. And so you see you have the differences for glucose right there, and glucose can form two isomers. The other thing that can happen is because the hemiacetal is unstable, in water, this covalent bond can break, and it can go back to the linear form, and then it can reform the beta form. So if you have a sample of alpha-glucopyranose here, and you put it in water, that bond will break, the water has enough energy to break the bond a little bit, and then it will reform, um, and it will form the beta-glucopyranose, and eventually you'll come to an equilibrium between alpha and beta. What it will look like is it will look like C1 is rotating up and down. The OH group on C1 can be on opposite sides, can start on opposite sides, it will end up on both on the same side. And it will, if you allow it to do that, if you put it in water and allow it to do that, it will react and come to an equilibrium where you'll have more of the more stable form. It turns out that glucose has one of these is more stable. You can find out by putting glucose in water and letting it come to equilibrium. Which form do I have more of? That's the more stable form. So we call this the anomeric carbon because we call those anomers, alpha and beta are isomers of each other that are called anomers. And the anomeric carbon interconverts from alpha to beta. Mutarotation is the name for this process. If I put sugar in water, it will come to equilibrium. It will react, and I will end up with the equilibrium distribution of whatever percent alpha form, whatever percent beta form. So the ring form, when it, uh, glucose reacts with itself, usually what you see for sugars, the stable forms are going to have either pentagons or hexagons. It turns out that those geometries fit well with the um, angles around the, the tetrahedral carbons. Tetrahedral carbon is like 109.5, right? So 109.5 degrees fits together okay into a hexagon or to a um, pentagon. And so if you have glucose, glucose, the C5 can react to form this stable hexagon, and we call that the pyranose form because it looks kind of like a pyran molecule. It's a hexagon molecule. Uh, fructose, on the other hand, the same thing will happen with its ketone, but its ketone, remember, is on C2. And so what it will have is it will have its C5 reacting with its C2 to form a hemiketal, and that looks like a pentagon, which looks like a furan molecule. So we call that the furanose form. 
Technically, glucose can form a furanose form, but it's just not very stable. Fructose, however, I don't believe fructose can form a, well, um, we can work that out, I think. Uh, so I'm not going to say anything about whether fructose can form, I have to sit down with paper to see if fructose can form a furanose form. I don't think it can. But I can tell you that glucose can form a furanose form, but it would be unstable and it would have two carbons sticking out as the periscope. So remember, we draw these as the periscope pointing up, and we draw them as these little hexagons. This is called a Hayworth projection. And one of the things in homework is if you memorize a sugar as the Fisher projection, you should be able to, in your head, cyclize it to form the Hayworth projection of that. And this is all done for you on these particular slides. So in your head, to go from a Hayworth projection, or to go from a Fisher projection to a Hayworth projection, Fisher projection is over here on the left. You can memorize this, and then in your head, you can sort of do the chemistry. Now, you don't have to do all the electron moving that they show here, but they show you that if you, to turn a Fisher into a Hayworth, what you do is you tilt it down. You like go um, what I call sugar tipping. It's like cow tipping, but it's different. You tilt it down, you like take this uh, reactive end and you push it down to the right so that what is left and right becomes, what is right becomes down, what is left becomes up. You see that's what's going on with this. And then you figure out which way the anomeric carbon is muta-rotated, and then you have your exact structure of your alpha or your beta glucose. So you have glucose having these two possible forms, but remember that on glucose you have right, left, right. On this side of glucose you have uh, right, left, right becomes down, up, down in this order. And so homework is there to give you practice and all that. Furanose, it does the same thing. You tip it over to the right. The OH, uh, the, the C5OH attacks, uh, yes, C5OH attacks, and it forms the fructose. Fructose has two periscopes in a sense because it's a ketose. The C1 is over here on the right, and the C5, or the, this is a C6, the C5 attacks. So C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6. I'm going to give you a little note card that will help you see how this conversion works. And the note card is that you take the, the index card like this, you fold at each carbon, you can form the cycle by uh, making the carbons bond each other, and you will literally tip it over so that what is right and left and coming towards you is going to be down and up and coming towards you once you tip it over. So that, that's the important thing is that the, the chemistry that we're talking about is the hemiacetal formation chemistry where you have an alcohol, the C5OH, at attacking the C1 aldehyde. Okay, so we, we have those. Now, muta rotation means if I put glucose in water, whatever form it starts out as, if I put it in water and let it come to equilibrium, it will always come to the same equilibrium. It will always come to being one-third alpha, two-thirds beta. So this means that the alpha is the less stable and the beta is more stable. That just means that I get more of it. So if you look at beta, you can actually uh, come up with a hypothesis. Why is the beta, why is it more stable to have the OH both on the same side as the um, periscope? So what you'll do is, if you put glucose in solution, you'll find out that most of it is going to be the um, pyranose form. You'll have a little trace of the linear form, but that's unstable, so you don't get much of that at equilibrium. Um, and you get a trace of the five-membered ring furanose form. But note that for glucose, this is less stable, and we just talk about what we see in solution. So the thing that you can see is that muta rotation looks like this is going on. It looks like you have, here is the alpha form, there's the beta form. So watch it rotate. Alpha form, it's on the opposite side as the periscope. Beta form, both on the same side as the periscope. So identify the periscope right here, and look at how this goes, and th this is the beta form. Now if you look at this, all of the other oxygens, all the other large atoms are pointing out. The beta form also has the oxygen pointing out rather than up and down. It turns out that this has less steric hindrance, and that is why the beta form is more stable. So having the oxygens pointing out is a little more stable than having them pointing straight up and down, 
because of steric hindrance. And so remember when you're looking at these that you're going to still have, you have six atoms that are um, tetrahedral in nature, single bonded, they are not flat, and so sugars are not flat. They actually have six membered rings, and we talk about those with the chair and boat conformations. Those can actually interconvert very easily because you're just talking about rotation of single bonded carbons, and they can rotate back and forth between two forms, the chair form and the boat form. The important thing about these is you can imagine the glucose having an axis like this, uh, that you spin the, hexa, the, the hexacarbons around. And if you have the, um, the, the one form, the two possible chair forms, they can interconvert between a chair form in which you have every other one being axial, pointing up, and every other one points out, and then you can flip between those. So the, the glucose can choose which of those forms is the more stable, and it's going to pick the form where it has the most bulky atoms being equatorial. And you'll see actually on the previous one, I believe that it had the form where all of the bulky atoms were equatorial is the beta form, and that ends up being a very stable form. So you see glucopyranose right here. This is what it looks like, and glucose is basically a flat pancake of a sugar where all of the big OHs are pointing out. They are all equatorial. The alpha form, you have one that's not equatorial, one that's axial. The beta form, they are all equatorial. And so you can uh, imagine this sort of axial equatorial interconversion going on like this. This is very easy to do. It's just carbon rotation. There's another, um, there's another other things that you have to memorize. There are derivatives of glucose, and I'm just going to show you what those are that you have to memorize. Um, there are some that are more complicated and they're biologically important, but I don't want you to memorize the ones that are more complicated. Let's keep it simple. Memorize that with glucose you can do these three biologically relevant modifications to it. You can put an amine group at C2. You can put a glucosamine, uh, you can put a, uh, an acetyl group on that amine group and make acetyl glucosamine. And then you can have glucose 6-phosphate, where you can put a phosphate on the, um, the alcohol. Anything you can do with an alcohol, you can do with a sugar. And so here you have just a group transfer to the alcohol where you put a phosphate on it. This is very important. It's what hexokinase does. In your book, you'll also see that you have these other forms. The ones that are important to remember are fucose, because that's actually an important deoxy sugar. But just remember that that's kind of a weird sugar. You're going to have to memorize that specifically. And then you have oxidized sugars. So you have a reduced sugar up here. You have three oxidized sugars that are the glucuronate. And you see there you've taken carbons, different carbons. C6 has been oxidized. C1 has been oxidized. And C1 has been oxidized and then reacted to form a lactone. Those are the important things. And if you know about sialic acid, here it is. But you don't have to memorize it. If it's not circled, you don't have to memorize it. So those are seven hexose derivatives. Those are also important enough that you need to know their names, three-letter abbreviations, ring size, and structure. But realize that for all of them except glucose, all of them except fucose, there are versions of glucose. And so you need to know like what a lactone looks like. You need to be able to um, say, if I have an amine at C2 on glucose, oh, it looks like this. And you'd be able to draw that if you know the glucose structure. Here are the um, abbreviations, and you see that the ones that we're memorizing tend to be the ones that have even their own little colored symbols. And so we'll use these in class, and um, now that we've talked about the organic chemistry, your job now is to learn this. You'll need to memorize these things by the test, and I'll give you points for drawing them for me. So find whatever way you can to learn these. And now I have to go off and give your test. So. Uh, Best wishes for test three, and when you're watching this, um, this is what test four is about. It's all downhill.